Today, I have a couple suttas to use to further illustrate the method of the perception of impermanence, uh, to give us some sense of how to approach just what it is the Buddha is talking about here. Uh, these are both relatively well-known suttas, so you might have encountered this material before. Um, or possibly not. Um, so, the first one is the Pena Pindupama Sutta from the Sanyutta Nikaya, the simile of the lump of foam. Who's familiar with this one? Okay, actually a couple, four people. Oh, that's good. Um, I refer to this sutta from time to time. Um, so I think it's worth going through it in detail. So this is from the Sanyutta Nikaya, chapter 22, uh, sutta number 95. Uh, so chapter 22 of the Sanyutta Nikaya is the Kanda Sanyutta, which is uh, all about the, the five components, as I was talking about yesterday. So body, feeling, perception, uh, uh, mental formations and consciousness, the five components of, of personal existence. So the Kanda Sanyutta is just a whole collection of discourses which are related in some way to that theme. Uh, so a lot of it is, is practical meditation advice, a lot of it is uh, more philosophical material. And uh, actually just on that point, I'd like to just briefly point out that there's actually no difference. Uh, the philosophical material in the Buddhist scriptures are meant to help us in our meditation practice. They're meant to help us in our daily life practice. Uh, it's meant to help us orient the mind uh, towards a clear vision of the way things are. Uh, so you, you can't really make a, a sharp distinction between saying, well, this is the practical stuff from the suttas, and this is the impractical stuff. There's no distinction. It's all practical. Uh, it's just some of it is more obviously practical than others. Anyway, so this sutta, uh, I'll go ahead and read it out. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Ayuja on the bank of the Ganges River. There he addressed the monks. Monks, a large lump of foam could be carried along by the Ganges River. A person with eyesight could see it, consider it, and examine it. By seeing it, considering it, and examining it, that person could determine that it was insubstantial, hollow, and essenceless. Monks, what essence can there be in a lump of foam? Monks, in exactly the same way, a monk sees, considers, and examines any physical form, whether past, present, or future, internal or external, gross or uh, coarse or subtle, <coughs> inferior or superior, near or far. By seeing it, considering it, and examining it, one determines that it is insubstantial, hollow, and essenceless. Monks, what essence can there be in physical forms? So this is um, starting off with uh, dealing with the, the body, with physical form. And this is not just our own body, but it's all physical things, all things that appear to be physical. Um, and uh, so the simile the Buddha uses here is uh, like a lump of foam. Uh, so if you've, uh, who's here has seen a lump of foam? Okay, pretty much everyone. So we all know what foam is like. Uh, so foam appears substantial. It appears solid. It looks like there's actually this like gob of white something on top of the water. But if you go and you try to pick it up, or you look very closely at it, what do you recognize? You recognize that there's not really anything there. There's nothing substantial there. There's nothing solid there. Um, it's, it's hollow. It's empty. Uh, there's not really anything... Of, uh, there's, no, there's no core unchanging essence. There's no core uh, reality to it. There's not really a thing there. There's merely the appearance of a thing. Um, so, uh, this is what he means when he says one can determine that it is insubstantial, hollow, and essenceless. So, essenceless is, the Pali word is asarika. So, 
uh, sara is translated here as essence. So sara means uh, like the, the true nature of something um, or the most essential part of something. So it's also used in saying, for example, the, the <coughs> core meaning of a paragraph, you would say, is its essence, like the essence of a saying or the essence of a book. Um, also the core of a tree, like the, the dense hard wood at the center of a tree, you would, is called its, its essence, its hardwood. Core. That's also what the word sara is used for. Uh, but sara is also used uh, in uh, when talking about objects or things. Uh, its essence or its its core, its heart would would be uh, if there was some absolute unchanging permanence to any particular thing. If there was something there uh, which uh, was absolute, which didn't change. Mm. So, what the Buddha is saying here is that when we look closely at the body, when we examine the body closely with mindfulness and concentration, then uh, we recognize that it has the outer appearance of solidity, the outer appearance of stability. But the closer we look at it, the more we recognize that there's nothing solid or stable to be found. You know, there's nothing... Uh, particularly real that can be found. So, uh, I was talking yesterday about developing the perception of impermanence. It's like, uh, our normal way of experiencing the body is as a solid object. A solid object with persistent existence through time. Um, like, it feels solid and it feels basically like the same body that we had a few minutes ago. Or at least that's what we think. But when we develop mindfulness and concentration, and we pay close attention through the perception of impermanence, what we recognize is that everything that makes up the body is constantly changing from moment to moment. So from moment to moment, it's always different. So that means there's no persistent, ongoing essence to the body. There's nothing unchanging. Uh, so the, the image here is kind of like a core an unchanging core around which other things rotate. So like, uh, if you take a snowball, um, and so a snowball rolling down a hill, what's going on? Uh, the snowball is constantly shedding snow, so as it rolls down the hill, it's leaving bits of snow behind, but it's also constantly picking up new snow, so it's constantly gathering snow. But if you take the snowball up and, and you take it apart, you can't find a core essence to it. You can't find a center to it. And over a period of time, as the snowball rolls down the hill, it may leave behind all the snow it started with, and eventually, by the time it gets to the bottom of the hill, be made up entirely of snow it's collected while rolling down the hill. So there appears to be an ongoing persistent object, namely a snowball, but in actuality, the object at the bottom is completely different from the object at the top. It only appears to be similar. There's no core essence there. Now, quite different would be a, a snowball made around a rock. Like, if you, ever, if you were ever, like, a really mean child, you might have done this before, where you start with a, a little stone, and then you pack snow around it. So you have something that looks harmless. It looks like a nice, soft snowball, but it's not harmless. So an object like that, uh, as, it, as it would roll down the hill, um, then it's leaving snow behind and picking up new snow, but there's that unchanging core, that unchanging essence, the stone at the middle of the snowball. So what the Buddha is saying here is that we cannot find that when we look at the body. When we examine the body closely, we cannot find an unchanging core. We cannot find anything anywhere in the body which remains completely the same moment after moment after moment. Um, so this is, uh, this then is why it's called essenceless. Um, there's no core permanent mm, essence there. There's nothing which remains the same. Um, but clearly there appears to be something. Um, so again, the, the phone. It's not that there's nothing there, it's just that it's not what it appears to be. 
So foam looks like a solid, stable object. But when we look more closely, we recognize that it's, it's hollow, it's insubstantial. Uh, but also another thing about foam that, that someone pointed out recently is that even the foam itself is constantly changing, it's constantly moving. So foam is made up of a bunch of little tiny bubbles. Uh, and the surface of the bubble, so uh, uh, it's like the surface is, is basically water or soap or some other material stretched in a very thin layer. And gravity is constantly pulling it down. So if you look closely at a bubble, you'll see that the surface of the bubble is constantly moving. It's not, not even the bubble itself is the same from moment to moment. It's always changing. Um, so this is, uh, again, it's, it's also very relevant to the body because uh, when we're not paying close attention to the body, it seems solid. Uh, but when we pay close attention, we recognize it's constantly moving and there's nothing ongoing. There's nothing persistent here. Mm -hmm. uh, another important thing to note here is that he says uh, one examines any physical form whether past, present, or future internal or external coarse or subtle uh, so coarse or subtle means uh, either obvious physical form or very subtle refined physical form uh, so for example in, in many metaphysical traditions they say that we have a coarse physical body and a subtle body um, so a subtle body is also included under physical form. Uh, devas, for example, devas, generally speaking, do not have coarse physical bodies, but they have subtle physical bodies. It's only the very highest deva realms where they don't even have that, where they don't have even a, a subtle physical body. But the lower deva realms, no state of existence is worth craving. <laughs> not even non-physical existence is worth craving. <laughs> I know that face. Um, uh, this is the danger. If you spend a lot of time around me, I will recognize your defilements, and I will call you out for them. So remain anonymous, and this won't happen. But get to know me, and I'll start calling you out. Um, with metta. Um, yeah, so... Um, the lower devas have refined physical bodies, uh, subtle physical bodies. Uh, but we view that in the same way. We recognize that it is, right, it's hollow, it's insubstantial. It has no core, permanent, ongoing essence. Uh, inferior or superior, uh, near or far. Uh, so just recognizing that this applies equally to all physical forms everywhere. So here the Buddha makes it clear that it's not just our own body, that we examine in this way. It's all physical things, uh, whether internal or external. Then the second simile, the Buddha says, monks, when it is raining in autumn and large raindrops are falling on the water, a water bubble might arise and vanish. A person with eyesight could see it, consider it, and examine it. By seeing it, considering it, and examining it, that person could determine that it was insubstantial, hollow, and essenceless. Monks, what essence could there be in a water bubble? Monks, in exactly the same way a monk sees, considers, and examines any feeling, whether past, present, or future, internal or external, coarse or subtle, inferior or superior, near or far. By seeing it, considering it, and examining it, one determines that it is insubstantial, hollow, and essenceless. Monks, what essence can there be in feelings? So the simile here uh, also I find quite apt. Uh, so in this case, uh, a raindrop falls and hits the water. And just for that one moment, there's this little burst right on the surface. So that's the simile he's using for feelings. So feelings are just these, these little temporary bursts uh, in sensation, this little temporary burst of pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Uh, but it's immediate, it's momentary. So the distinction here from the lump of foam, the lump of foam is something which appears to have ongoing existence over time. But when we look closely, we recognize there's not really anything there. There's no, there's no core to it. 
There appears to be a solid object, but it has no ongoing core. Uh, in the case of feeling, uh, it's of a succession of uh, brief momentary flashes, uh, disconnected flashes. So uh, if you've ever looked at the surface of a pool of water while it was raining, uh, there's just all these little bursts uh, appearing all over the surface of the water, and it's always in different places. It's never in quite exactly the same place in sequence. It seems to be happening all over the water. So also with feeling, when we watch closely, what we recognize is all these different little individual bursts of feeling happening. So there's a little burst of pain, and a little burst of pleasure, and a little burst of pain, and a little burst of neutral, and a little burst of neutral, and a little burst of pain. It's all over, and it's always different each time. It's always a little bit different. So, uh, and also the nature of a water bubble. Um, so we talk about it as a, a, a separate object, but what's actually happening? So the raindrop hits the water, and the water temporarily deforms. So it's a temporary deformation. So there's the appearance of a thing there, the appearance of a thing that wasn't there before, but actually it's just a different way of perceiving what was already present. So similarly, when there's a sensation in the body, the sensation is there, and then we temporarily perceive it as painful or pleasant. So that's a temporary alteration of something. Uh, so it's also pointing to the, the fact that feeling is an alteration of the underlying sensation. So the underlying sensation does not inherently contain pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. But it's like when our preference hits sensation, then there's this little flash of pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. This little splash of pain, pleasure, or neither. So, uh, as I see it, what the Buddha is really emphasizing in this case is the immediate, momentary, temporariness of feeling. Uh, how it's just this, this quick, instantaneous burst. Um, and also, again, how it's, uh, it's hitting or altering something underlying. So there's that underlying sensation, and then we, we alter it uh, with our preference, which leads to pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. The third simile the Buddha uses here. Uh, Monks, in the last month of summer, a wavering mirage might appear at midday. Uh, who here has seen a mirage? Okay, pretty much everyone. Uh, the most common mirage is, uh, like, if you, if you look at the road at just the right angle, it'll look like there's a pool of water on the road. But as you get closer, and the angle you're looking at it shifts a bit, you'll realize there's no water there that it was just a mirage. Uh, there appeared to be water on the surface uh, of, the, of the road, but there was actually nothing there. There was no water at all. So the Buddha says, In the last month of summer, a wavering mirage might appear at midday. A person with eyesight could see it, consider it, and examine it. By seeing it, considering it, and examining it, that person could determine that it was insubstantial, hollow, and essenceless. Monks, what essence could there be in a mirage? Monks, in exactly the same way a monk sees, considers, and examines any perception, whether past, present, or future, internal or external, coarse or subtle, inferior or superior, near or far. By seeing it, considering it, and examining it, one determines that it is insubstantial, hollow, and essenceless. Monks, what essence can there be in perceptions? So perception or recognition, uh, as I was talking about yesterday, is the... Uh, the recognition process, the identification process, by which we decide what something is, and then project our decision onto the actual experience. Um, so, for example, I look at Charity's shirt and decide that it's green. So now I'm projecting the image of a green shirt. I have no idea what it is. Um, well, actually, I'm, I don't personally have red green color blindness, so I'm pretty sure it's green. But somebody who has red-green color blindness, which is extremely common, would not be able to tell any clear distinction between Charity's shirt and uh, 
Ben's shirt. Uh, they would look basically the same. Um, so, uh, regardless, the point is that when, so when seeing that, I say that's red, so I'm projecting red, the experience of red. I see that, I say green, I'm projecting the experience of green. What the actual underlying experience is, uh, is uh, it's beyond words or concepts. The underlying experience we can't say is red or green, it's just an experience. It's visual contact. Um, so then, in our practice, we're working to get below that layer of perception and to be aware of the direct sensory contact, uh, the actual sensory contact that's happening. And then we can see the process of, of recognition or identification or perception happening on top of that. But having that clear distinction between the raw experience and then the process of, of identification, of perception. So the simile he uses here of a mirage uh, is it's quite apt uh, because when you first see that, that shimmering, wavering uh, image on the road, uh, you might first think, oh, that's a pool of water. That's clearly a pool of water. What else would it be? Um, I remember when I was learning to drive uh, many, many years ago, uh, and I was out driving in the countryside. And in the distance, I saw this huge pool of water on the road, and I'm like, oh, it's, it's just a mirage, I'm used to that, I've seen it before. <laughs> and I got closer, and I was like, oh my gosh, and I slammed on the brakes, because it actually was a huge pool of water on the road. <laughs> <laughs> so in this case, it was the other way around. Instead of seeing a dry road and thinking it was wet, uh, I actually saw a huge pool of water and thought it was just, just a mirage. I thought it was just perception playing, playing tricks on me as usual. Um, as it turned out, a fire hydrant had broken and it completely flooded the road there. <laughs> um, yeah, the mind plays tricks on you. Uh, so this is the nature of perception. Uh, we think we're seeing one thing. Uh, because we're, we're placing an image on top of the actual experience. So it's like the mirage is like an image of water on top of the actual experience of seeing a road. So we're projecting an image onto something, projecting something that's not there onto what's there. So the projected image is not real per se. It's real in our mind. It's a real experience. We actually are having the experience of seeing the mirage. But the mirage itself is not real. Uh, it's, it's insubstantial. It has no, no actual existence. Uh, it only has existence as uh, a projection of the mind. Then the fourth simile. Monks, a person who needs heartwood, who is seeking heartwood, who is searching for heartwood, might take a sharp axe and enter a forest. So as I mentioned earlier, a heartwood is the, the dense hardwood at the core of a tree. Um, and this is the same word sara that is translated elsewhere in the sutta as essence. So in this particular simile, the Buddha is making a pun, which he does extremely often. And generally speaking, you won't catch this in translation because it's usually impossible to translate. Um, and rarely will, will translators even point out the puns in the Pali Canon because there's so many of them. So this is one thing that, that really gets lost in translation is the Buddha's sense of humor. Um, the Pali Canon is full of all these like amusing little jokes and puns and uh, things which you just, you just cannot get in translation. Uh, but uh, you, you can almost just imagine the Buddha having this little like half smile, the sort of like knowing half smile that he's saying something really clever and funny <laughs> and nobody's getting it. <laughs> yeah, I th personally I think of the Buddha as a very light-hearted person. Uh, why would you not be? If you were fully enlightened, uh, you've recognized that everything is perfectly okay just as it is. Why would you not be completely light-hearted? Anyway. So, I highly recommend, learn Pali, read the suttas in Pali, and you'll just start laughing. It's just hilarious all over the place. Anyway, so, 
Um, a person who needs heartwood, who is seeking heartwood, who is searching for heartwood, might take a sharp axe and enter a forest. There he might see a large plantain tree, straight, fresh, and tall. Has anyone seen a plantain tree? A few people? Okay. So a uh, plantain tree is, well, it looks like a tree, but what it actually is, it's not actually a tree. Uh, what it is, is a, uh, like it starts <laughs> off as, as like a leaf, and then that leaf forms other leaves, and it's just this bundle of leaves, like tightly wrapped bundle of leaves. So I haven't seen one myself, but I've read about them on the internet, which is good enough. <laughs> <laughs> What I have seen is onions, which uh, is similar. So an onion doesn't have a, a core. Yeah. Uh, so like a, a peach, uh, if you eat a peach, then eventually you get through the flesh and there's this hard pit at the center. But uh, an onion, you can just keep peeling off layer and layer and layer after an onion, uh, of an onion, and eventually you just don't have anything. Like you never get to the center of an onion because there is no center. It's just layers all the way down. Okay, every once in a rare while you find a little vaguely spherical gob of onion right at the center. That's true, I've seen it as well. Um, so an onion perhaps is not the perfect analogy for this. Um, I'm trying to think of something else. What do we have in this country that's like a plantain tree? Nothing. <laughs> So, uh, he could cut it down at the base, cut off the crown, and peel off the leaves. While peeling off the leaves, he would not even find sapwood, let alone hardwood. So again, if you, if you cut down a plantain tree and you just start peeling off the leaves, then you'll just keep peeling off leaf after leaf after leaf until eventually you run out of leaves and there's nothing there. Again, similar to like most onions. An artichoke. Artichoke? Uh, no. It doesn't work. Um, similar to like, yeah? One of those uh, Easter egg chocolate things that looks like it's really big and awesome, but then you bite into it and it's hollow in a minute and looks like you're very sad. <laughs> oh, I think that fits better under physical what, form. What about one of those lollipops, like, and you, you think it has bubblegum in the middle, but then it just keeps going and going and going. And it's just oh, a lollipop yeah, all the way through. Yeah, that's really disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> Or I'm thinking of like the, the Russian Mitroska dolls, mm -hmm. is that what they're called? Yeah. Where like you keep opening it and there's another doll and you open it and there's another doll and you open oh. it and, and then there's nothing there and you're just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but the Buddha used a plantain tree because there's a lot of those in India. Um, unfortunately, there's not so many around here. So, while peeling off the leaves, he would not even find sapwood, let alone hardwood. So there's no wood inside a plantain tree, because it's not a tree, it's just a bundle of leaves. <coughs> a person with eyesight could see it, consider it, and examine it. By seeing it, considering it, and examining it, that person could determine that it was insubstantial, hollow, and essenceless. Monks, what essence could there be in a plantain tree? Again, he's making this little pun. So, what essence could there be in a plantain tree? You could also translate that. What hardwood could there be in a plantain tree? Same word, sahara, essence or hardwood. Monks, in exactly the same way a monk sees, considers, and examines any mental formation, whether past, present, or future, internal or external, coarse or subtle, inferior or superior, near or far. By seeing it, considering it, and examining it, one determines that it is insubstantial, hollow, and essenceless. Monks, what essence can there be in mental formations? So, uh, mental formations is, uh, it's a translation here of the word sankara. Um, so mental formations includes uh, thoughts, emotions, memories, ideas, attitudes, moods, uh, all of that fits in this category. So, the, the simile here is, so we're, we're looking at the mind, uh, and we see all these different objects moving through the mind. Uh, so we just start peeling them away. It's like, well, am I a hatred of broccoli? A 
Apparently not. Apparently that's not me because that went away many years ago. It's like, well, am I uh, a love of sweet things? Well, okay, that's still here, but we can take that away and imagine it's not here. But like we just keep killing it away. And so what are we looking for? Um, we're trying to find that core essential aspect of the mind that's always the same, that never changes. So what is, what is there in the mind that's always there? So we keep peeling things away. It's like, well, is it thinking about the boat that I want to buy? I actually don't want a boat. I can't imagine why someone would. But is it thinking about buying a boat? No, because that's only there some of the time. Is it thinking about going home? No, that's, that's only there some of the time. Well, I don't have a home, so it's not really relevant. Uh, or uh, thinking about movies, or thinking about chocolate, or thinking about uh, books, uh, or is it feelings of love, or feelings of hatred, or uh, is it an attitude of, of boredom, or an attitude of interest? So we, we just keep looking, and each thing we look at, we're like, actually, that's not there all the time. So that's clearly not the, the core essence of the mind. So we keep pulling things away, and eventually we run out of things. Eventually we recognize that there isn't anything that is always unerringly present in the mind. Not even awareness itself is always present in the mind, because we have moments of unawareness. Most of us, unless you're either an insomniac or an extremely advanced meditator, most of us experience unconsciousness at least once a day, at night, when we sleep. Uh, so there's, uh, even awareness is not a consistent, ongoing essence of mind. So this is the simile he's using. So we just keep, we look at the, the components of mind, the objects of mind, and, and we consider what is the essence of mind? What's the core, unchanging part of the mind? We keep pulling things away. Not this, not this, not this, not this, not this. And finally we realize there's nothing. There's no aspect of the mind which is always the same, which is always there. Okay, and the last simile he uses, he says, Monks, an illusionist or an apprentice illusionist could display an illusion at a crossroads. A person with eyesight could see it, consider it, and examine it. By seeing it, considering it, and examining it, that person could determine that it was insubstantial, hollow, and essenceless. Monks, what essence could there be in an illusion? Monks, in exactly the same way, a monk sees, considers, and examines any form of consciousness, whether past, present, or future, internal or external, coarse or subtle, inferior or superior, near or far. By seeing it, considering it, and examining it, one determines that it is insubstantial, hollow, and essenceless. Monks, what essence can there be in consciousness? So who here has been to a, a magic show? Okay, I've never been. Um, when, I was, when I was a kid, I really wanted to go, but for some reason it never worked out. Um, I used to know a few magic tricks. I've long since forgotten everything. Um, uh, but all these, all these little ways of, of making it appear that you're, you're pulling a coin out of someone's ear or that you're pulling a rabbit out of a hat is like the, the old classic one, or that you're cutting someone in half. Uh, but it's all just tricks. And it's all just tricks meant to deceive the viewer into thinking something is going on that isn't actually happening. So that's what the Buddha says is going on with consciousness. So consciousness is the experience, I am seeing that. I am hearing that. I am smelling that. So that's consciousness. Consciousness is the experience of I sensing that of self and other, and a sensory process of self experiencing other. But elsewhere in the suttas, uh, I, in, in retrospect, I wish I'd uh, done this other sutta as well, because it's also a really lovely sutta. Uh, Molyapaguna Sutta from the Nidana Sanyutta. Molyapaguna comes to the Buddha and asks the Buddha, so who is it that feels? And the Buddha says, well, that's not a valid question. That doesn't make any sense. You're not asking the right thing. The right thing to ask is, what is the origin of feeling? 
Uh, and, and then he says, uh, feeling arises as a result of X, Y, Z, and he, and he goes through this. And there's a series of questions where Modiya Pagana keeps saying, like, who is it that sees? Who is it that thinks? Who is it that this? Who is it that that? And the Buddha always, always just comes back to saying, well, it's not that there's a who that is thinking. There's just thinking arising as a result of other conditions. There's not a who that is seeing. There's just seeing that arises as a result of other conditions. So he's always stripping away that self and other distinction. So there's clearly seeing happening right now. But there's not a me seeing not me. There's just seeing. And even the seeing is conditional. Even the seeing only occurs under specific conditions, under specific circumstances. So then the illusion here is the illusion of self-perceiving other. Is everyone on board? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. There's another sutta uh, where the Buddha, uh, he's speaking to Bahya. Uh, I think the commentaries give his, his further name as Dharuchirika, possibly. Uh, Bahia, anyway. It's, it's known as the Bahia Sutta. Um, and I first came across this sutta when I was uh, when I was practicing Zen, because it's a very popular sutta in Zen. Um, so Bahia was a um, ascetic who was not initially practicing Buddhism. He was practicing one of the other spiritual traditions at the time. And he got to a point where he had some wacky experience in meditation and decided that he was enlightened. It was like, that's it, I'm enlightened now. So he's sitting on the banks of the river thinking, wow, it's so awesome, I'm enlightened. And then a deva came to him and said, Bahya, I've got some bad news. <laughs> First off, you're not enlightened. Second, you're not even practicing in a way that will eventually lead to enlightenment. And Bahya is like, Oh crap. Um, now what do I do? And the Deva's like, but I've got some good news as well. Good news is that there actually is someone in the world who is enlightened, and he's teaching other people the path. So you should go and talk to him. So then Bahia goes off and finds the Buddha, and uh, at the time Buddha was going on alms round. Um, so you saw I had my alms bowl earlier. So the Buddha had taken his alms bowl and he was walking through town so that people could give him food so that he wouldn't die. Uh, and uh, That's something important to remember. So when people give us food, what they're saying is, I don't want you to die. <laughs> so remember that. So earlier today, Juanita came here and she told all of us that she wants us to, to not die. She wants all of us to keep living. <laughs> so that was, that was extremely sweet. I was actually really touched by that. Um, that that Juanita and her family members came and uh, prepared all this lovely food and, and gave it to all of us so that we would continue living and be able to continue practicing. It was really sweet. Um. Okay, so where was I? Oh, Bahia. <laughs> I was momentarily distracted by thoughts of, of the kindness and generosity of Juanita. Um, okay, so Bahia. Uh, Bahia goes up to the Buddha while the Buddha is out on alms round, collecting his food for the day. And, and Bahia says uh, something to the effect of, like, please teach me. Uh, I need to know the path. Please teach me. And the Buddha says, this really isn't the time. Like, I'm on alms round. Wait until after I've had my meal. And then you can come and talk to me and ask your questions. And Bahia says, no, I want to know now. Tell me now. What's the path? And the Buddha's like, you really don't get it. I said I'm on alms round. We can talk after I'm done eating. Be patient. And Bahia's like, look. <laughs> He's like, I get it, but I might die before you finish your meal. Or you might die before you finish your meal and then we'll never get a chance to talk. And then Buddha's like, okay, since apparently I'm not getting through to you, I'll give you a teaching. Um, so right there, the Buddha then uh, said to him uh, a few short statements, and I'll try to remember it, but I might get it a little bit off. 
Um, later on, I'll, I'll pull up the exact sutta so I can give you the exact quote. He says, In the scene, let there be just the scene. In the herd, let there be just the herd. In the sensed, let there be just the sensed. In the cognized, let there be just the cognized. When you practice in this way, uh, there will be no you in terms of this, no you in terms of that, and no you anywhere in between. Just this is the end of suffering. Uh, and hearing that, Bahia uh, attained stream entry. He attained the first stage of awakening. So with just that, that short teaching, he examined his experience and recognized exactly what the Buddha has been talking about uh, throughout the sutta. He recognized that in body and mind there was no core persistent essence, which was who he really was. He recognized that in a sensory process there's no seer and object, there's just seeing. There's no hearer and sound, there's just hearing. So, uh, recognizing that, he let go of attachment to body and mind, and was able to attain uh, the first stage of awakening. And then he asked the Buddha, uh, uh, well, first he praises the Buddha and says how awesome that was, and then, then he asked the Buddha to be ordained. He asked the Buddha to ordain him as a monk. And the Buddha says, uh, well, do you have uh, a set of robes and an alms bowl? And Bahia says, well, no. And the Buddha says, well, I can't ordain you if you don't have robes and a bowl. So go and get robes and a bowl, and then I'll ordain you. And then Bahia went off looking for robes and a bowl and was killed by a stray cow. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently it's a good thing that he got that teaching when he got it, because his, his days were numbered. <laughs> um, I'll find the sutta later. It's a really lovely, uh, really lovely teaching. Um, So, uh, so that's the, the five similes that the Buddha gives. So, uh, physical form is like foam, like a lump of foam. Feelings are like water bubbles. Uh, uh, perceptions are like mirages. So perception is like a mirage. Uh, mental formations are like uh, the leaves of a plantain tree. Um, and consciousness is like a magical illusion. So, uh, finishing up the sutta, there's a bit more here. Monks, when a learned disciple of the Noble One sees in this way, he becomes disenchanted with physical form, disenchanted with feeling, disenchanted with perception, disenchanted with mental formations, disenchanted with consciousness. Being disenchanted, he becomes dispassionate. Dispassion liberates. When there is liberation, one knows liberated. One understands birth has been eliminated, the spiritual life has been completed, what was to be done has been done, there will be no further existence here. So this paragraph touches on several very important topics. Uh, first off, disenchantment. Uh, disenchantment and dispassion. So disenchantment is when we no longer fall under the spell of the world. So normally we're very enamored with our bodies. Uh, because our bodies are, one, a source of pleasure, and two, it's, it's who we think we are. We think I am this body, or we think this body is mine. So we tend to be very, very obsessed and caught up with our bodies. So, uh, and that's, again, it's like being enchanted. It's like being put under a spell. Uh, we're completely uh, absorbed uh, with the body. But when we recognize that the body is like a lump of foam, that it's insubstantial, hollow, and essenceless, that it's not who we are, then it loses its appeal. Uh, it lacks the ability to trap us in the same way. Uh, similarly with feeling, perception, mental formations, and consciousness. Uh, when, when we recognize their true nature, they no longer have the ability to trap us. We realize that there's nothing there worth hanging on to. 
There's nothing there worth getting caught up in or getting obsessed with. Um, one saying that my preceptor uses, uh, he says, it's like trading candy for gold. Um, so it's recognizing all along that that's this thing that we thought was so valuable is actually not valuable at all. But there's something of infinite value that lies just behind it, just beneath it, just on the other side of it. And the way we recognize that is through letting go of attachment to this. Letting go of attachment to body and mind. So being disenchanted, one becomes dispassionate. Um, so dispassion is, uh, again, it's, it's not getting, well, passionate about things. Uh, it's, not getting, uh, it's not getting wrapped up in that uh, narrowing of view. That happens. So when we're completely passionate with something, then we forget everything else. It's like if, when you're with your when you're with your partner, when you're with your uh, your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your transgender friend, and uh, and you're just totally focused on your on your partner. There's nothing else in the whole world. There's nobody else in the whole world. It's just you and them, and that's it. So what's going on there is that we lose our perspective. We lose our sense of perspective and we're just totally focused on this one thing. So that's the nature of passion. The nature of passion is that it blinds the mind. It blinds us. Uh, it keeps us caught in a very narrow, limited experience. And also the nature of passion is that, uh, so we lose perspective, uh, which means that we lose a sense of the consequences of our actions. Uh, we can start to say or do things which are, they make sense within the limited view of the impassioned mind, but they don't make any sense uh, outside of that limited perspective. Um, so when you're, when you're completely obsessed with something, you might do anything for the sake of that. Uh, you might lie, you might steal, you might kill for the sake of the object of your passion. So a mind that is impassioned, that's completely dominated by passion for something, uh, has no restraint and has no wisdom. So it's a state to be, to be very wary of, to be very wary of entering into the blindness uh, of an impassioned mind. So it's important here though to make a distinction between passion and enthusiasm. So you can have an enthusiasm for the Dhamma, for example, uh, but that's not the same as this narrow, blind, uncontrolled state of extreme attachment and obsession uh, that we mean when we say passion in a Buddhist context. Then the Buddha says, dispassion liberates. Viraga vimuchati. It's a very brief, direct, pointed statement. Viraga vimuchati. That itself should give us a sense of the importance of dispassion. Dispassion itself leads to liberation. Just like that. So not allowing the mind to become narrowed down by any experience. Not allowing the mind become, to become obsessed or fixated on any experience or anything. That alone is sufficient for liberation, because that's non-attachment. That's complete uh, non-attachment, not sticking on anything, not being caught on anything, letting go of everything. When there is liberation, one knows liberated. So this is an important distinction. Um, so the Buddha makes it very clear that when you attain enlightenment, you know that you've attained enlightenment. So there's a certain individual who fortunately no longer claims to be Buddhist, but a certain individual who used to claim to be Buddhist, and he, uh, he again, at one point he had a, a far out experience when he was meditating, um, and at the time he, he, he was like, well, that's far out and trippy, but he didn't really think much of it. But then a few months later he was reflecting on it and he was like, oh, I think that was enlightenment. I think I attained enlightenment a few months ago. Turns out I'm an enlightened being. And then he went around telling people he was enlightened. Well, from a Buddhist standpoint, he's not enlightened because he would have known it the moment it happened. 
there's not the slightest shred of doubt in your mind. Uh, with the attainment of enlightenment, one immediately perceives absolute reality. One immediately perceives absolute truth, just as it is. Which includes the awareness that one has just attained enlightenment. That's included within that vast scope of awareness. One understands birth has been eliminated, the spiritual life has been completed, what was to be done has been done, there will be no further existence here. So, uh, again, when one attains full awakening, one is no longer limited to personal existence. One is no longer caught in this one tiny perspective of me experiencing that of me and not me, of self and other. We're no longer trapped in that experience. So that's why it said, birth has been eliminated and there will be no further existence here. Because there will be no further experience of an individual experiencing something other than itself. That's gone because there's no longer identification as anything. So there's no longer entrapment by anything. We're no longer caught on anything. So the experience then is absolute boundlessness, all-inclusive boundlessness. So it's not accurate to say that an enlightened being is non-existent, or that they cease to exist when they die. That's not an accurate statement. It's also not an accurate statement to say they exist after they die. Um, so it's, it's one of the, the standard sets of questions that every now and then people would go and ask the Buddha. They'd ask, the, they'd ask them a, a total of ten things, but I'm just going to talk about four of them. They would ask, does an enlightened being exist after they die? Do they not exist after they die? Do they both exist and not exist after they die? Do they neither exist nor not exist after they die? So, set of four. They're trying to cover all their bases. And the Buddha refused to answer either yes or no to any of these questions. Uh, instead, and most of the time, he just wouldn't answer at all. Uh, but there's a handful of places where he does answer, and the way he answers is he says that the concepts of existence and non-existence have no relevance in that case. It's like you're talking about sound and you're trying to describe it using colors. It just doesn't make any sense. No, the snow shovel does not sound green. The truck does not sound purple. That just doesn't make any sense. In the same way, it just doesn't make any sense to talk about an awakened being as either existent or non-existent or both or neither. It just doesn't apply. Um, the spiritual life has been completed, uh, and what was to be done has been done. This indicates that uh, there's nothing further beyond awakening. There's nothing further beyond enlightenment. Once you've reached enlightenment, that's it. There's nothing else you need to do, because at that point, uh, there, uh, the entire spectrum of reality is completely apparent. So there's nothing further that needs to be done, because it's all there. There's nothing extra that can be added. It's not possible to add anything extra. This is what the Blessed One said. When this was said, the Sublime One, the Teacher, further said this. So the rest here is in verse, so it's Pali poetry. And any poetry loses its flavor in translation. So this is going to sound a little bit awkward, but that's the nature of any translated poetry. Form is like a lump of foam. Feelings are like water bubbles. Perception is like a mirage. Mental formations are like plantain trees. Consciousness is like an illusion. This is what was said by the kinsman of the sun. So, Adichabandhu, kinsman of the sun. This is one of the less common names of the Buddha. Oh, which is just delicious, kinsman of the sun. One who considers in this way and wisely examines, sees that it is insubstantial and hollow. Referring to this body, it was said by the one of abundant wisdom that when three things are lost, one sees the body abandoned. Vitality, heat, and consciousness. When the body has lost these things, then it lies discarded and insentient, food for other beings. This is the continuity, this illusion which deceives the foolish. 
It is called a murderer, and here no essence can be found. Regarding these components in this way, an energetic monk is clearly aware and mindful, whether it is day or night. One should abandon all the fetters and make a refuge for oneself. Live as though your head is on fire, intent upon the path to the deathless. So a couple things here that are worth uh, clarifying. Um, so uh, he points out that, so identification with the body is the illusion which deceives us and causes us to continue <coughs> to experience limited states of existence. And it's called a murderer because our identification as this body is what causes us to constantly experience death. The reason why we constantly experience death is because we think we're bodies. So it's like, I am this body, and then this body dies. So I have the experience of death. So then I think, well, uh, I guess I'm that body over there, and then that body dies. So then we just find another body and say, well, I must be that body, and then that body dies. So this is why it's called the murderers, because it's constantly making us experience death. But it's our own delusion that makes us experience death. It's not the fault of the body, it's just the nature of bodies to be born and die. That's what bodies do. But we keep foolishly identifying as bodies, thinking, I am that body. And therefore, we, uh, we take on the experience of that body, which includes the experience of death. It includes the experience of, uh, of pain and torment and, and discontent and all of that. Uh, so one should abandon all the fetters, so that's referring to the ten obstacles to attaining awakening, the ten fetters. Um, and uh, in a few weeks, another monk is coming to teach a retreat focused on the ten fetters. So you can learn all about them at that time, so I won't talk about them now. Uh, and the phrase, live as though your head is on fire. Um, so this is one of the quotes from the suttas that has become uh, pervasive. It's, it's kind of taken on a life of its own. So live as though your head is on fire. What would you do if your head was on fire? Scream. Yeah, and then what would you do? Stop. You went put out the fire. You would... I'm not going to ask you questions anymore. It's like, oh, I look in the mirror and maybe get a comb. No, if your head is on fire, then you do everything you can to put it out. Uh, so, he's saying we should practice, we should, we should live our life as though our head is on fire. So, as though we're in imminent risk of severe disaster if we don't do something right away. So, also when we're meditating, uh, when we're meditating, if our head is on fire, would we sit there daydreaming about Game of Thrones? <laughs> so, your, your head's on fire and you're like, okay, I wonder who is it that's going to wind up on the throne this time? And, no, no. You're going to go and... I, I actually haven't seen any of them, by the way, so I can't say anything cogent about it. Um, no, you would stop thinking about Game of Thrones and you would go douse your head right away. So similarly, that's the attitude we should have. As long as we have uh, the delusion that body and mind are permanent and personal, then that's like being on fire. And it's time to put the fire out. Okay, so that's the first sutta, uh, the Pena Pindupama Sutta, the simile of the lump of foam. Next, the Kachana Gota Sutta, which is possibly my favorite sutta in the whole Pali Canon. Um, I know it's not good to have favorites because actually I love, I love all the suttas for, the, for <laughs> different reasons. But this one just brings up such a smile on my face. I just love it so much. It's also really short. It's only a single page. Kachana Gota Sutta. This is from the Sanyutta Nikaya, chapter 12, verse number 15. Sutta number 15. So, chapter 12 of the Sanyutta Nikaya is all about dependent origination, the Ticca Samuppada, which is another topic that I dearly adore. But we need to do another Ticca Samuppada retreat. At Savati, 
Then Venerable Kachanagota approached the Blessed One, paid respects to him, and sat down to one side. When he was seated to one side, Venerable Kachanagota said to the Blessed One, Bhante, it is said, right perspective, right perspective. Bhante, how is there right perspective? So right perspective, uh, Samma Ditti, is the first element of the Noble Eightfold Path. Kachana, for the most part, this world is based upon a duality, existence and non-existence. Kachana, one who accurately sees with right wisdom the arising of the world, does not have the thought of non-existence. Kachana, one who accurately sees with right wisdom the cessation of the world, does not have the thought of existence. Kachana, for the most part, this world is bound by procurement, attachment, and adherence. And as regards that procurement and attachment by the mind, that resolution and tendency towards adherence, when one does not procure, does not attach to, and does not resolve upon thoughts of myself, when one has no doubt about, no uncertainty of, and no dependence on another for the knowledge that it is only suffering that arises and only suffering that ceases. This, kachana, is right perspective. Everything exists. Kachana, this is one extreme. Nothing exists. This is the second extreme. Kachana, without approaching either of these two extremes, the Tathagata teaches Dhamma by the middle. Due to ignorance, there are conditional formations. Due to conditional formations, there is consciousness. Due to consciousness, there is mind and body. Due to mind and body, there are the six senses. Due to the six senses, there is sense contact. Due to sense contact, there is feeling. Due to feeling, there is craving. Due to craving, there is attachment. Due to attachment, there is existence. Due to existence, there is birth. Due to birth, there is old age and dying, sorrow, lamentation, pain, depression, and anguish are produced. In this way, there is the arising of this entire mass of suffering. However, when there is complete detachment from and cessation of ignorance, there is the cessation of conditional formations. From the cessation of conditional formations, there is the cessation of consciousness. From the cessation of consciousness, there is the cessation of mind and body. From the cessation of mind and body, there is the cessation of the six senses. From the cessation of the six senses, there is the cessation of sense contact. From the cessation of sense contact, there is the cessation of feeling. From the cessation of feeling, there is the cessation of craving. From the cessation of craving, there is the cessation of attachment. From the cessation of attachment, there is the cessation of existence. From the cessation of existence, there is the cessation of birth. From the cessation of birth, Old age, dying, sorrow, lamentation, pain, depression, and anguish cease. In this way, there is the cessation of this entire mass of suffering. It's just delicious. <laughs> Do you feel me on this? Who loves this sutta? <laughs> Okay, that's really disappointing. I want to see some more hands in the air. Who loves the sutta? Who loves the sutta? Okay, that's much better. Um. So yeah, again, anyone who says that Theravada doesn't talk about emptiness, here it is. This is very clearly talking about emptiness. So the Buddha, uh, what he's stating in this sutta is that neither the concepts of existence nor the concepts of non-existence have any relevance. Nothing can be said to either exist or to not exist. Or to put it another way, things can be said to simultaneously exist and not exist. Um, so that's been actually one of the ongoing debates in Buddhism over the last 2500 years, is do things both exist and not exist? Or do they neither exist nor not exist? And properly speaking, actually, we can't speak in those terms either. <laughs> Is everyone with me? Yeah. <laughs> um, so what the Buddha is pointing to here, then, is to drop 
all idea of either existence or non-existence, to just put it down. And normally our big problem is that we're attached to existence. We're attached to things existing. We think this body exists, this mind exists, this is all real. That's our normal problem. So in the beginning, our practice uh, usually benefits from some emphasis on non-existence, from some emphasis on cessation, some emphasis on things coming to an end. So in the perception of impermanence then, constantly noticing things changing, there's actually two things going on in change. There's arising and ceasing. There's coming into being and there's ceasing to be. So in particular, in the beginning, it's, it's worth paying some attention to the ceasing of things, to things coming to an end, in order to counterbalance our normal tendency to focus on things existing. So uh, all this talk of, for example, of the five components being insubstantial, hollow, and essenceless. That's a way of, of getting us to, to stop looking at the apparent existence of things, and instead to look at the apparent non-existence of things. So it's balancing the mind, balancing out that tendency to focus on existence, with instead focusing on non-existence for some time. And then what we find is, once we have that balance, then we can let go of both polar extremes. We can let go of this concept of opposites, this concept that existence and non-existence are somehow opposite or opposed. Um, so like, uh, you might think of a coin. So on one side of the coin is existence, on the other side is non-existence. But the coin is just the coin. The coin cannot be said to be either existence or non-existence. Uh, but it also completely encompasses both. So then, this is the state of all things. It's the way of all things. All things are, uh, they have uh, both existence and non-existence. And they cannot be said to be completely either one, or exclusively either one. So instead, what we have is that when there is ignorance, when there is delusion, then there arises this experience of separate objects, this experience of a self perceiving an other. There arises the experience of mind and body as me and mine. There arises the experience of senses, of sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, and thought, as me and mine, perceiving not me and not mine. There arises the experience of pleasure and pain. There arises craving, desire for pleasure, and desire to avoid pain. There arises attachment and obsession uh, to particular experiences. There arises attachment to certain states of being, so there arises attachment to certain experiences, uh, obsession with certain experiences or with certain states of mind or particular stations in life. And then as a result of that, then we experience decay, dying, pain, sorrow, grief, misery, despair, and the whole mass of suffering. That's what I want to see. <laughs> yes. Yes. Feel the joy of the Dhamma. <laughs> um, so that's the point, is that it's not to say whether this experience is real or not real. That's entirely beside the point. But rather it's pointing to the fact that the reason why we're having this experience, whether it's real or not, the reason why we're having this experience is because of that root fundamental ignorance, that root fundamental delusion. And that root fundamental delusion is the delusion of self-existence, the delusion of me. The delusion, I am, I exist. This is me, here I am. It's the basic root delusion from which this whole mass of torment arises. This whole experience of discontent and dissatisfaction arises. The flip side of that is that when we overcome that delusion, uh, when we uh, eliminate and relinquish that delusion, then uh, this whole experience of tormented existence also similarly uh, is seen to be hollow, insubstantial, essenceless. It's not who we are, so there's no problem. Uh, so it's not that when we attain awakening we cease to exist. Uh, if so, the Buddha would have just blinked out of existence the moment he attained awakening, and he wouldn't have been around to teach. 
Instead, he was around to teach for another 45 years. So it's not that he ceased to exist the moment he attained awakening, but rather there was a recognition that there was absolutely nothing anywhere in the universe, anywhere in any universe, past, present, or future, that was him. There was absolutely nothing anywhere that could be said to be, to be him or his. So with that, there was, uh, again, it was seeing through the facade, seeing through the illusion, seeing through the mirage, and recognizing the actual nature of reality, recognizing how our apparent experiences arise as the result of delusion, and that with the elimination of that delusion, then the distorted experience vanishes immediately. And with it, uh, as he says, uh, it's only suffering that arises and only suffering that ceases. So we might think, oh, but samsara is so beautiful and it has all these lovely things. No, it doesn't. It's only suffering. <laughs> <laughs> it's only suffering that arises uh, because it's all based upon a distorted misperception of reality. That's why there's this experience of imperfection and distortion in our lives. It's because we're starting off from a false premise, a false assertion. So everything is wrong right from the start. So it's only suffering that arises because we started off on the wrong basis. It's like if you try to build a house on a swamp, you're like, oh, this is such a magnificent house, and then it sinks into the swamp. Well, the, the fault is not with the house. The house was perfectly fine. The fault was that you tried to build it on a swamp. <laughs> so there's nothing inherently wrong with samsara. The problem is that we're building our experience on a swamp on a false perception of reality. We're building it on a delusion. We're building it on a distorted basis. Okay, he's feeling the joy. <laughs> so, uh, instead we build our house on solid ground. And actually, when you recognize solid ground, then you realize there's no need to build a house because everything's already there. There's nothing that needs to be built. In fact, there's no point in building anything at that point. It's all, it's all there. And simultaneously not there. <laughs> <laughs> Which, as it turns out, is perfectly okay. There's nothing wrong whatsoever. So that's the Kachana Gota Sutta. Do you see why I love it so much? Okay, I see a handful of nods. Um, so this is why we're practicing the perception of impermanence, which, let's get on and do it. Yeah.